Uh, maybe you could use the microphone uh, there or here. Uh, please kindly state your name and organization. Hello. Yes. We'd like to request one question per person so we have more chances. Um, my question is for the incoming ambassador. Uh, your name uh, first, please. Yes. Um, to, uh, to the Philippines, the Philippines Ambassador General, Philippine Ambassador you mentioned a while ago that um, in proceeding with our relations with China, there will be like a separation or a bifurcation of contentious issues and non contentious issues. How you identify the contentious issues, and you said you're going to approach it in a way that you're going to do it um, in a quiet diplomacy, and you'll proceed with the contentious issues one by one. Um, I'd like to know whether um, what kind of track are you looking at in approaching this? Is this a track one, uh, track 1.5, track two? Uh, Perapas Ambassador is a very distinguished and very courageous media group. Uh, the basic idea is make sure the disputes are not at the front and center, blocking all the other areas of cooperation. You, you move it so that you have separate tracks. And then for economic cooperation, which is non-contentious, you go fast. There are no debates, no, I mean, you do due, due diligence, transparency, and, and feasibility study. But as you just go according to the best business practice. For the disputes, I mean, the dis what are the disputes now? I mean, it should be fairly clear. Who owns Scarborough Show? Who owns the Spratleys? And now, a third issue is really, how do we view the arbitral tribunal? We uphold it, the Philippines upholds it, China rejects it. So we have to discuss it and understand each other's position. We don't expect to come, we don't expect the Chinese to change their minds overnight or through one session. It will take time. Territorial disputes, and, and this is one part of the presentation I, I took up because it's too long. Basically, from the experience, the most recent experience, or the negotiating, the experience of countries negotiating with China, the most recent cases have been really Vietnam and Russia or Soviet Union. They were able to solve their territorial dispute. It took time. But basically, the basic lesson is, if you use hardball tactics with China, expect the same or more. So, when you say, what is ours is ours, they'll say the same thing. What's ours is ours. And if you don't yield, you know, and, and, and if you combine it with just uh, megaphone diplomacy and forcing your way, expect that there will be a stalemate. In the case of Vietnam and the Soviet Union, it resulted in border conflict, border war. So, they basically decided, in the case of Vietnam, after the Soviet Union collapsed, there was no more superpower supporting it. So they decided best to have good political relations with China and start on the basis of a good political atmosphere to negotiate. And in the end, they were able to solve their land border dispute. And in, in the end, they were, China and Vietnam were able to divide, draw a borderline 50-50 on the Gulf of Tonkin. In the case of the Soviet Union, of course it takes time. It took eight years in the case of Vietnam. In the case of uh, the Soviet Union, it took almost 10 years of negotiation after the collapse of the Soviet Union. They started in the 70s, but of course the negotiations did not go anywhere until the Soviet Union and then, or then Russia decided to have good political relations with China. And it was in, a, in, in an atmosphere of uh, quiet, you know, using quiet diplomacy and using uh, the atmosphere of good political relations and the use of high-level summit diplomacy that they were finally able to solve the border dispute on, in Northeast China. When Mao was alive, he said, I won't yield an inch of territory. This is sorry, the new Tsars of Russia. It was taken from China under the old Tsars. But in the end, after Mao died, after Deng died, Jiang Zemin reached a compromise. They divided at the Amur River. The border line is in the middle of the Amur River. And an island that was contested was again split in the middle. So it's possible to achieve 
One by one, basically, you have to deal with Rector Bank, you have to deal with Mischief Reef, you have to deal with Scarborough Shoal, how to formalize what's happening there. But the point is, there's, a, there's quite a list, and it's going to take time. Don't expect that it will be solved overnight. That's why you separate. Because if you wait for the disputes to be resolved before you can have cooperation, nothing will happen. So basically, you try to separate two tracks. One will go real fast. The other one will go according to the speed of consensus that can be achieved. And, and this is what happened. The use of high-level diplomacy between Xi Jinping and Duterte was what resulted in the consensus that, brought, that enabled, you know, that, that made our fishermen regain their traditional fishing rights in Scarborough. It's an informal, a friendly understanding. You have to, you have to slowly formalize that. You, have, you need the rules of engagement between the Coast Guards. And, and the same is true for the whole West Philippine Sea. One benefit, by the way, that is happening right now is that the supplies to Ayumin Shoal, to the, to the rickety ship that the Philippine Marines have there, are now allowed, are, are, are going on. Not, the blockade has been lifted. The same is true in Fort Pagasa and the other, you know, the supply lines are now no longer being hampered. And generally, any encounters of Chinese Coast Guard and Philippine Coast Guard ships in the West Philippine Sea, they're trying to have the right contacts and be able to avoid any conflict. The, Philippine, uh, the Chinese Navy ships from Scarborough, as far as the recent reports are, are concerned, have withdrawn from Scarborough. What's left there are the Chinese Coast Guard ships. The Chinese, of course, still maintain their effective control because they have a sovereignty claim. But now the Philippine Coast Guard is trying to have a roving presence so that eventually we could also say that we have not given up our sovereignty claim while we resolve it diplomatically. Just to follow up on that, um, Mr. Santana, uh, yeah. do you see China leaving the Scarborough Shoal soon? Or in the long run at least? <laughs> this is our hope, but uh, I, I am more realistic. I think, I think the way out eventually is cooperation between the two sides. The way out for the disputes in the long run, and this is my personal opinion, is some form of, you know, you have to convince, well, you have to convince our, we have to convince ourselves and we have to convince China that this is the common heritage of mankind. And, and the UNCLOS, the UN Law of the Sea, has a provision on this. When you border the same sea, you should be able to cooperate to conserve the resources to manage the resources, fishery, the coral, and even the oil and gas. So, so I think it will take time. I don't expect it overnight. It may not happen even during the, the third administration, but we'll give it a shot. And the key though is that you separate it and you don't allow it to be an obstacle to the development of bilateral ties because we experienced this before. We looked at bilateral approach and multilateral approach as binary. That you can only have one or the other. You can actually combine the two and have two tracks. So this is the approach that should be adopted. Thank you.